Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we are finally going to do something about these two fellas who have been out the front of my storage building for far too long. I have started making little shelves inside of here which are going to widen out into a broader floor space, a second floor to my storage room where we are going to host a villager trading hall, among other things, because this space is actually going to be really large and the space we will need for a villager trading hall will probably not be that big. But there are obviously lots of little alcoves and niches where we can put the different villager professions and focus on acquiring a bunch of villagers whose professions match our needs. Specifically, there are some things you can trade from villagers which can also be mined in the world, like redstone and redstone dust is the thing that the cleric villagers will trade you. You can also get lapis renewably from cleric villagers, and some stuff like that is just going to be easier than getting hold of it from going out mining, because Anywhere you mine in the real world, the resources are going to be finite, whereas being able to trade from villagers will be able to get those resources renewably without doing additional damage to the world around us. I've also found it really convenient to have a source of experience quite close to home, and trading pumpkins and melons to the farmer villager here has been enough to repair my tools and elytra when we've been working on larger build projects, and so instead of going all the way to the guardian farm, we can just get a quick top up on one or two tools. It feels like the guardian farm should really be something we use when we want to repair everything across the board or when a pickaxe is worn down to a stub. So having villagers around can be a really convenient way of farming experience and I thought today we would take a look at villager breeding so we can get hold of a bunch more of them. Then we can acquire a bunch of villagers of different professions and put them up here on the second floor of my storage room so that we can access them and so that they are safe from any attackers from the outside like pillagers and zombies. Another thing I would like to do is get reliable access to certain enchanted books because while over here at the igloo in the igloo basement we have our mending villager and he's going to be really useful for any future tools we need to imbue with mending. I'm also considering enchanting a shield with mending considering that my shield keeps breaking down over the last few episodes after I lost the banner shield to the slime attack. But I would also love to get a librarian villager who has the unbreaking enchantment as one of their trades because unbreaking three is one of those books that I never seem to get out of the enchantment table and there are a couple of my tools like the shears that I have in my ender chest which are missing unbreaking as a crucial enchantment. So if we can secure this guy make sure he is safe maybe move the leather worker in there as well since I haven't traded with this one at all and find a way of getting hold of a bunch more villagers then that's going to be an ideal setup for the force future. I suppose at this point it's also worth noting that Mojang has been experimenting with rebalancing villager trades in their more recent snapshots, and there is a version of villager trading currently in development in which you need to go to different biomes and find villagers of different regions in order to get hold of some of the more valuable trades. So mending and unbreaking and efficiency enchantments might be found at three separate villages. But I had a world back in the Minecraft 1.13 update when we updated to 1.14 and a bunch of stuff about villager trading changed and any villagers that you already had traded with in the world kept any existing trades they had before that. So there is a chance that if we set up a villager trading hall up here with a bunch of different villagers, we won't need to worry too much about the regions of the villagers, even if they make those changes in future, which right now there is no confirmation about whether or not those changes will be appearing in an upcoming update. They are still under debate and still receiving feedback on that stuff, so we don't know for certain whether those changes are coming or not. So in the meantime, we're just going to go ahead and set up a short-term villager breeder here by my base, which should have everything we need to get the villager villager trading hall started, we can move some villagers into the upstairs floor and make sure that they have the workstations they need to produce a bunch of really cool trades for us. And one thing that's really worth noting before you set up a villager breeder somewhere like your base is the proximity of beds. Villagers will search for beds in a 48 block spherical radius. So whenever you want to set up a villager breeder somewhere nearby, even a temporary one, it's important that it remains 48 blocks away from any beds you need to keep placed in the world. I think setting up our villager breeder over here temporarily is going to make the most sense and we can remove any beds that I put in the blacksmith's house or my starter house or the uh, factory over here if we want to and that's going to ensure that the villagers will only be focused on the beds we're going to leave inside the area where we want them to breed. And setting up the area for our villagers to breed is going to be pretty simple. We need some building blocks, we need a handful of beds, we'll just need three of these since we're only going to be using two villagers. And the third bed is going to be for any baby villagers who are born but they're going to leave the breeding cell and 
probably untether from that bed as we move them up to the villager trading hall so we don't need to worry about that third bed being claimed forever. I'm going to break the logs down into some planks here and we're just going to build out an area around the outside of this making sure that the walls are at least two blocks high so that even villagers getting on top of the beds here aren't going to be able to leave the area and then along one wall of this we're going to dig out a two block deep trench in the floor that the baby villagers are going to fall into and they're going to do that because we're going to have some trap doors over the top here opened up like this and that's going to trick the villagers into thinking that they can pathfind over here and they should fall down this gap into what's going to be a water stream that will take them away towards our storage room. We'll put the water stream in here and every time it's going to run out we can simply have it move down a block and the villagers should continue to drift along with the current. In the meantime we're going to prevent the adult villagers from escaping from this by putting a set of blocks above there and so baby villagers who are only one block high should be able to run over the top of these trapdoors and get swept away by the water stream. Of course we want to make sure there's some lighting in here so that no mobs spawn in here in the meantime and we can always put a roof over the top of it if we're concerned about mobs getting in somehow. If we're being extra careful here we also want to make sure that the water stream here is covered with probably just a covering of slabs or something like that so that other mobs like zombies can't get in here either. But like I said this is going to be a very temporary setup and we're not going to worry too much about the safety of it right now. There are much safer ways of doing this if you want a permanently set up villager breeder but we're only going to be setting this up for the duration that it takes to populate our villager trading hall up here which should not be all that long. Now when it comes to putting villagers inside this little trading block all we're going to do is move the two villagers that we have out here in there. That makes the most sense for now and we'll look at rescuing the ones from the igloo a little bit later but the simplest way of moving them around is going to be using minecarts and some rails. In fact we might even be able to pick up a villager through the corner of these two blocks here if we put a powered rail right up against the fletching table in front of him. We'll have a couple of powered rails here just for a little boost of speed. That should be enough to get them up a couple of slopes of regular rail. We'll stick another powered rail in here so that they're momentum stays high enough and we should be able to get them over to this little box that we've set up for villager breeding. Let's give it a try. Hopefully our minecart should be able to collect the Fletcher villager right away like that. Nope, doesn't look like it quite hit him. Okay, not to worry. He is kind of standing closer to this back corner, so maybe we can collect him from there instead. This seems a little bit more likely to collect the villager. Let's see. Yep, there we go. Instantly pulled him out of there and as you can see, he already tried to pair to something else right there. He tried to pair to, I think, the bed in my storage room but now now that we can remove him from this minecart he should pair to one of these beds when given the opportunity and the villagers will look for beds throughout the day but chances are they'll readjust those things around the early and later parts of the day because during the regular part of the day they're probably going to be focused on work. Now if we wanted to continue trading with this villager we could move his workstation in here with him. Obviously got to make sure that we don't end up making the walls too high so that the villager can escape. They should not need to have a workstation block nearby in order to breed though. All villagers need in order to breed is enough beds that there is at least one left over so that a child can be born and have a bed of their own and they will need some food. So we are going to head down to the crop fields, grab some carrots and potatoes that we can throw to the villagers and hopefully that will put them in the mood to breed. But we're going to do the same thing with the farmer villager who does seem to be stuck in the northeastern corner of his little cell over here so we're going to remove that, pack up all of our powered rails and power components and attach them to the other side of here so that the farmer can be directed into the same villager breeder. And just by pushing Pushing the minecart over here. There we go, we've yoinked the farmer out of his little cell as well and he can head off towards the breeder. So these two villagers are going to be our breeding pair for the moment. We're going to go and grab some crops and if you wanted to set up a more permanent setup for this you might also leave an area where the farmer can tend to some crops and throw them to the other villagers because that is the mechanic that can sustain more natural villager breeding in a naturally generated village where the villagers will try to bring the population back up to normal if any villagers are killed for any reason and they'll do that by the farmers distributing crops at which point they simply try to find equilibrium with the amount of beds in the area. So down here, relatively close to our vacant villager trading cells, is the end of the water stream that we set up before. And this is where we're going to store a bunch of villagers, relatively close to my storage area here. And most importantly, far enough away from this little villager breeding cell that they won't claim any of the beds, and therefore these two villagers will detect this bed as empty and want to produce a third villager. So throughout this, one of the more important factors is that we move any new baby villagers as far away from those beds as reasonably possible, just so that the villagers over there aren't going to detect 
the baby villagers still needing a bed. And for the moment, I am going to put a couple of pieces of glass over the top there so that we can look down and see whether or not there are any baby villagers being produced. But once a couple of baby villagers have showed up in there, we can set up a system to collect them with minecarts, much the same as we just did the regular villagers. And we'll set up the minecarts to transport the villagers up to the second level of our storage room where the trading hall is going to go, which means I can finally take down these little villager trading booths that have been out to the front of my storage room for a while. And <laughs> we're starting to tidy up all of the miscellaneous projects I had around here that never truly had a home. Our next phase is, of course, to make sure that these two villagers want to breed. So we're going to head down to the field with our fortune pickaxe and gather up a bunch of carrots. Villagers should only need about seven or eight carrots in order to breed, but we want them to breed multiple times. So we'll chuck them a couple of stacks of carrots and they'll start distributing them to each other if either of them is getting low. And later in the day, if we see any heart particles emerging from this, did I just hear a baby villager already? <laughs> we did! Look at that! A baby villager was born almost instantly thanks to just handing them a bunch of carrots, stepping back and letting them do their thing. So we have our first villager down there. Fantastic news. Now all that remains is to start setting up the area up here for a villager trading hall. And before long, we should have a few more younger villagers born who we can recruit for different professions once they grow into full grown villagers. So a short time later, I did have to move the end point of our villager breeding setup one more water stream over, basically another eight blocks over so that the villagers would produce another baby villager because it seemed like they were still slightly too close and one of them was still paired to the beds. You can usually tell because they are pathfinding towards the water stream, which usually means they are trying to return to the bed that they've already connected themselves to over there. But I have seen another baby villager just pop up in the breeder, which means that it should sooner or later be making its way down here. And since I didn't really explain this, the reason that we put the trap doors there is because baby villagers tend to run around quite a lot. They're at that age where they don't really have anything to do. They can't pair to a job site block. And so typically the game has them run around villages chasing each other and that kind of stuff whereas in this case they simply run underneath the trap doors assuming that the trap doors are blocks they can walk on that drops them into the water stream and that's how they end up here where sooner or later we should have three or four villagers just kind of sat in here in the meantime I have been working on the inside of this trading hall and the ceiling looks very flat right now. We are going to change that a little bit later, perhaps not in this video, but in future I will work on designing this so it looks a little bit more interesting inside of here. But up here we have a nice open flat space and I've left the central area kind of opened out like this so that we can still see down into the storage system and from below we can still see up. And I think I will leave it like this or maybe tighten it in slightly more, but I do want to leave the central area feeling a little bit more open around the edge Edges, though we have plenty of room to set up villagers for our villager trading space and that's going to be a series of booths sort of like the ones we had out there but perhaps with a little bit less zombie protection since as long as we have a roof over our heads and enough lighting around here I'm fairly certain zombies will not be an issue. The first profession I'm going to focus on is going to be clerics because like I said I'm really interested in getting hold of lots of redstone dust from clerics so it makes perfect sense to focus those first and in here somewhere, I believe, there we go, we have a bunch of blaze rods. We should be able to convert a bunch of those into brewing stands. Let's say we want maybe seven or eight. I think eight seems like a good number. All we got to do is grab eight of those. We'll grab a stack of cobblestone and we should be able to make eight brewing stands. And these are going to be the workstations for our clerics who we can tuck into one corner of this second level to our storage room. I think we'll probably put them over here and typically what we want to do is space them out one or two blocks apart with a space the villager can stand behind here and some blocks around the outside so that they don't end up wandering around too much because of course villagers are pretty terrible at taking care of themselves and if we leave this open there is a chance that they will try and drop down to an area below take full damage and then just wander off. I'm not quite certain what blocks I want to surround them with but I do want to make sure that they stay out of harm's way and stay contained in here. So one other thing we're going to need to do is give the villagers the impression that they can pathfind out of a one block space. And you can give them a couple of extra blocks to walk around in if you want to, but if you want your villager trading stations to be nice and compact so that the villagers are always there and ready for you to trade with them, I recommend putting a trap door on top of each of these brewing stands because that will give the villager the impression that they can walk out onto a block like this. It's kind of a neat way of tricking their pathfinding AI into assuming that they can move around. There are a couple of other tricks that people will often do to make sure that 
that the villagers stay in place, and one of those is putting a magma block somewhere around at floor level, because villagers will avoid walking over those, and that can even prevent the villagers from doing too much pathfinding, which is often a good thing when you're trying to keep lag down in structures like this, because villager pathfinding AI can turn out to be a fairly laggy thing to have around. But since this is a single player world, we already have a ton of hoppers around here that aren't really causing a great deal of lag, I shouldn't need to worry too much about the effects on performance. So now those brewing stand workstations are set up, and we have a couple of villagers ready to be recruited as clerics, all we need to do is get them from down here to up there. So I'm going to break through the little skylight that I installed, and we're going to install one more section of flowing water. But instead of having it flow in a single stream like this, we're going to have the water flow into a corner of a small room. Let's make this something like a 4x4 four four area, and we will dig out the floor underneath this so that all of the water flows into the far corner. That way the villagers are going to end up in this corner as well, and using the same trick we used to get them out of the trading booths that were on the surface, we can capture a villager in this corner using a minecart. I'm going to put the glass over this corner so I can see whether or not any villagers are waiting to be collected, and down here is where we're going to set up the minecart rail that will take them into the upper level of the storage room. Sounds like we just got another baby villager in there as well. Yes, perfect. Okay, he is currently resting against the wall down there. So I'm going to tear up a little bit of the pathway that leads into the storage room just temporarily so that we can install a staircase that's going to have some rails running up it. We're going to end this with a two block long section because if we send the minecart down a diagonal ramp and it just ends in a solid block, sometimes anything that's in the minecart can end up suffocating in the wall and we don't want to do that with these villagers, we want to avoid that at all costs really. So this section here can be made out of powered rail just to make sure the villagers get powered up the slope. We'll throw a block of redstone in here or a lever or some kind of power source that can power the entire thing and I'll quickly check that throwing a minecart down this hill is not going to have any adverse effects. Nope, there we go, we got ourselves a villager first try, excellent news. So we're going to run this rail out into the center of the room from which we can take a left turn and staircase up to the center of that platform over there where we've set up our brewing stands. Once again, we're going to make sure that the majority of the rails on this staircase are powered rails just so that they have the momentum to get the villager up the slope, but then once we are here, we should be able to deposit the villager behind one of these brewing stands. And I need to work out what kind of building blocks we're putting around the clerics to make sure that they are safe in there, but I'm going to use magenta wool for some of it because it's a similar color to the cleric's robes. So let's put the magenta wool there to make sure that the villager stops behind this brewing stand. Hopefully everything we've set up here should be enough. I might reposition some of the powered rail if it seems like the villager is stopping at any point, but now we should simply be able to push him forward like this. Once he hits the powered rail, he will zoom away, should be able to make it up the slope, and should come to rest behind that first brewing stand, by which time he will already be interested in becoming a cleric. There we go. And it looks like he has a redstone trade first in the list of trades. That's ideal. In fact, a very good reason to start with clerics here is that I'm fairly certain they always begin with a redstone dust trade, but it should be fairly simple to swap that out if not. I think they can sometimes have a gold trade in there, but either way, hopefully this cleric has now paired with this brewing stand. We're going to carefully remove the rails out from underneath him. We're going to block off every other block in this area that the cleric could possibly jump out of the minecart onto, and it seems like he's already using this workstation to top up on his trades, so that's ideal. Now we should be able to look past the brewing stand here and break him out of the minecart, like so. All of the magenta blocks are currently temporary, but I'm going to put a torch in there with him for now, and he has a little tent <laughs> that he can hang out in, and it seems like he is paired to this brewing stand no problem. One thing to bear in mind, and this was more of an issue on Java Edition in the past, I think it has been fixed, but it might still be a problem on Bedrock Edition, is that if a villager has line of sight to another workstation of its similar type, then it's potentially going to try to pair to this workstation since they think that they can pathfind over these trapdoors. And so one thing you might want to do in the arrangement of your villager trading hall is arrange the villagers in a line blocking line of sight to any other workstations that they could be pairing to. So it might not have been the best idea to put these brewing stands opposite this cleric. However, recent changes to Java edition villagers have eliminated this problem because the villager will simply go to the nearest available workstation and it won't end up taking a workstation from another villager, especially if they are of different ranks. So once we rank up these villagers and get them all to master professions, they should have no problem with connecting to somebody else's brewing stand. 
If they do, of course, we can always break and replace the brewing stands to try and correct that, but that can be a fiddly process and you don't really want to mess around with that too much. So if that becomes an issue, what I will probably end up doing is remodeling the orientation of these brewing stands so they turn around a corner here instead of being opposite each other in adjacent rows like this. But anyway, now we've got one cleric in place. We can, of course, trade with him once to lock in those trades, but we can also move another cleric into the brewing stand next door. If I send a minecart down here right now, there's a chance it will come back with another villager. So I'm hoping that we've got enough villagers left in the tank for it to bring us another adult villager that we can use. Oh, it's brought us a baby villager. Well, it looks like the baby villager crept into that corner and I've accidentally sent it back down the rail. That's not a problem though, we should be able to install the baby villager behind here and they will still grow up while they're in a minecart. So we don't need to worry too much about this villager being juvenile for now. It will grow into a full grown adult villager and should adopt the same profession. The main thing though, is that we can't take this one out of the minecart because it's small and chances are it will escape through the edge of a block or something like that. So for the moment, we're simply going to light this up, keep this villager contained and come back to retrieve the minecart later. Which is why I made two minecarts. So we're going to send the other one off. Hopefully this one will return with an adult villager as well. They should be pushed into the corner by that water stream. So the minecart should retrieve a villager. And there we go. If it doesn't, of course, that means that there are no villagers left in the tank. And we can always wait for the breeding pair of villagers to produce a couple more. But once again, we are moving them out of the range of that breeding pair of villagers and any of those beds. So chances are these villagers will not try and hold up the breeding process while the other two villagers are active. With all of these blocks in place, we can remove this villager from the minecart and there is the problem. You see, they end up getting out of here far too often and he's trying to pathfind back to the area where he started from, which may be the bed, it may be the workstation, it may be the villager he was last gossiping with. But the trapdoors do allow them to pathfind over the workstation, so that's something to bear in mind. The other important thing is remember not to panic. We have an infinite villager breeder, so if something happens to this villager, we're always capable of getting more. But the best way of getting a villager back into a minecart is to place it near a curved section of rail like this. If the villager stays in a corner of the build like this, we can kind of push him into the center there, and mobs don't typically like to pathfind over rail unless they've already chosen a direction to pathfind. A corner rail is also the ideal place to pop a villager into a minecart because the minecart's hitbox extends over the edges of the rail block for a second and onto the neighboring blocks around it. So that's often a really good way of ensuring that a villager or another mob gets back into a minecart. We can put the minecart back onto a section of rail, give him a bit of a nudge, and he should end up going roughly where we want him to, at which point we can connect him up to the same piece of rail and deposit him in the same place. And this time <laughs> he's paired to the brewing stand and we can be a little bit more careful about extracting him from the minecart. There we go, I'll put a block over his head this time and there we go, we can extract him from the minecart. He doesn't even take any damage in the ceiling blocks or anything he doesn't pop up when he leaves the minecart and if we are able to let's say break out a block here we should be able to pick up the minecart through those blocks and the villager is in place excellent so now we have three clerics all of whom should have that redstone dust trade that we can lock in and i wonder if our villager breeder has produced any more villagers we can head down here and check the glass window and it doesn't look like any more have been produced yet but chances are we just need to feed them a few more carrots and they'll end up producing a few more villagers. And now I've done one trade with each of these clerics. We now have the redstone dust trades locked in since they have done their first trade. Bear in mind that on Bedrock Edition, I believe you still need to trade up to master level profession before their profession will be locked in and they can't just pair to a different type of workstation. So keep that one in mind. All we need to do is wait for these villagers to breed a few more, move them into the trading hall when they are ready and we can assign different professions to them as we please. So I'm going to go ahead and do a bunch more of that because it's just going to be the same activity repeated over and over so you folks don't need to see too much of that. In terms of my personal priorities we're going to fill up this corner with the clerics then we're going to move on to librarians and stonemasons who I think have a pretty underrated set of trades but I've got a lot more work to do before we can really take advantage of that so I'm going to start moving some more villagers and I'll see you folks on the other side. Hey folks, welcome back. I have made significant progress on the villager situation. I've also modified this setup a little bit and I will explain why in just a second, but we are very close to having three full sets of villagers of specific professions all loaded up in here. And I'll take you back up to the second floor in the storage area where now we have 
a couple of villager boots, I decided instead of magenta wool, magenta terracotta was going to blend in better with the cleric's uniforms. And I do want to have some sort of like cleric styled banner of sorts up here. So the wool there is really just a reminder for now that I want to do something to note this as the cleric's alcove, cleric corner if you like. But these are all now locked into their professions, I believe. I think I traded with all of them anyway, and each of them trades redstone. It doesn't seem like they have any trades they swap out. The gold trade doesn't appear until a little bit later. But on this side over here, we have eight stonemasons, and stonemasons are actually a really vital thing to have if you want to get hold of some blocks renewably and quickly, because Later on in their trades, they have the trades for the block of quartz and quartz pillar, both of which can, of course, be crafted out of the quartz that you mine from the nether. But of course, that becomes difficult to find once you go further and further out in the nether trying to find it. It suffers from diminishing returns a little bit. And of course, you're crafting four quartz items into a single block of quartz and then crafting it in a stone cutter or on a crafting table to change its shape and designs from there. Whereas these villagers will be able to trade you a single quartz block for a single emerald, which makes it a very easy way to get hold of those blocks renewably without having to spend quartz, which you could otherwise spend on observers, comparators, and daylight detectors is the other reason to keep raw quartz around. So I think having these is going to be a really good idea, not to mention some of them, not all of them, but some of them may end up trading full dripstone blocks, which means we don't have to use the pointed dripstone from our dripstone farm to craft those and will allow us to get some of those that we can use in making the floating island. That was one of the reasons actually that I paused on the floating island project and set about making this villager trading hall in the first place. This alcove over here, the one that actually faces out over the land, is the one where I've set up a bunch of farmers, at least most of them are farmers. Some of them are still younger villagers in minecarts, but this one has just grown up. So I'm going to take him out of the minecart. We've got trap doors in there to make sure they can't simply walk out of the booths and the composter can go back in and this guy will turn back into a farmer once the workday begins. Now, it looks like these two still have a little bit of growing up to do, but we should hopefully at some stage have another villager who we can bring into this spot here and that will be the farmers all done. And I've decided to decorate each of the booths with a couple of blocks that seem like they work for the villager profession. Obviously over here we've got the magenta. Over there I've got red because I think the librarian's books on their heads are sometimes like they've got like a red bookmark in them and it sort of made sense it went with the bookshelves, nice warm color. And then of course the stonemasons having the gray block that's actually cyan terracotta but it appears gray and throwing some bricks in there just kind of felt appropriate for the profession. So this has been working out relatively well in terms of a villager breeding setup, but a couple of hitches have come up. Of course, you need to keep supplying these villagers with food whenever you want them to produce offspring, which they do seem to be doing thanks to the fact that I threw in a bunch of food fairly recently from the carrots and potatoes that were growing down here in the farm. Aside from these three beds, I decided to set up some beds over here on the opposite side of our water drop. And that's really to encourage the children who are born to pair to one of these beds. And then of course they cross over the trap doors and try and pathfind to the beds. And instead they fall into the water and get carried off towards the stream. Sometimes they will try and bounce on these beds during the day as well. So that's another great way of making sure that they end up falling into the water and get carried away towards our villager trading setup. But these two villagers have been sometimes a little reluctant to breed. And I decided to take out the workstations that I had in here for a couple of reasons. The first of which was that they seem to be more of a distraction than anything. And occasionally when those thunder cloud particles appear, there we go, the uh, baby villager is now making its way into the system here. The thunder cloud particles indicate that these villagers for whatever reason decide not to produce offspring and it may be that some of the villagers that we've already sent into the system are still paired to these beds and these villagers remember that but sometimes it also seems to be that one of the villagers is distracted by another task and in the case of the fletcher it might be that the fletching table in there was causing it to not want to breed because for whatever reason <laughs> it was more interested in working at the job site block and i put the composter in here as well for a little while just to see if they could be distracted by that during the day and then come together again during meeting times and what I discovered I think 
what is happening is that the farmer visiting the composter is actually occasionally composting the crops from his inventory and that became a bit of a problem because it wastes the food that we throw in there for them instead of them stockpiling it and using it to breed in future. So the result was that the villager breeding process felt kind of slow and was running into a few hitches, most of which I think are now resolved by these additional expansions that we have made and the removal of those job site blocks. Occasionally, if you find you need to kickstart the villager breeding process for whatever reason, I recommend coming in here, removing all of the beds and then replacing them because it may have something to do with the time of day or it may be that the villagers are still paired to the beds from where they originally were born and then they don't lose that for whatever reason. The game doesn't quite let go of it when you move them outside of the radius of the beds. But if you log out or replace these beds, there's a couple of things that will indicate to the villagers that those beds are no longer there and they'll kind of reset their priorities when it comes to their points of interest. Sometimes you'll even see green particles as the villagers make their way around here in the minecart and that's usually because they found my bed here at the back of the storage system where I moved it to prevent it from entangling with the villager breeding setup over there in the distance. But for the most part this has been a fairly smooth process and it seems like that baby villager made its way into the water stream easily enough so now I should be able to send this minecart off down the slide it'll come back with a villager and this will be the last one that we're moving into the setup with the composters that has our bank of farmers there we go those are those green particles i'm pretty sure that was related to the bed down there since baby villagers can't pair to a workstation until they reach full maturity we're going to take out the rails in there we're going to block in this villager right here we're going to put that last hay bale on there for decoration and all we need to do is remove the composter when this villager grows up break the minecart they shouldn't be able to escape from there and we'll be able to put the composter back in and considering that we can break and replace the composter without the villager walking out of this booth we can afford to be a little bit picky about the trades here right now we've got carrot and potato trades and then wheat and beet trades on some of these and it really depends what you're growing more of what you want to replace here but of course i'm going to go for carrots and potatoes primarily because while they are slightly more expensive trades you get more per crop than you do from the wheat and the beetroot. You end up getting lots of seeds from each of those crops, but not as many of the crops themselves, so I think carrots and potatoes are easier to farm. In the farmer's early trades, we also get the option to buy bread directly, but really what we're looking for from each of these farmers is going to be the melon and pumpkin trades, along with the golden carrot trade at the end that's going to keep us stockpiled with food. Now the next thing we're going to move on to is the librarians over here and that's where we're going to be looking for very specific trades from them. I've set up a lectern over here already and we're probably going to put bookshelf blocks in between each of these as well for decoration. But the thing you might be wondering, especially when it comes to the librarians, is am I going to be zombifying and curing these villagers? Am I going to be exploiting them for that additional trade discount that we get for curing them from a zombie villager? And the answer to that is eventually yes, but I'm not going to do it right now for a couple of reasons. The first of which is that most of the time, with the exception of the farmers, I'm mostly looking to get stuff from these villagers that we can buy for a single emerald and that the discounts aren't going to affect. So the redstone dust in this case, I can just buy for one emerald. The same goes for the lapis trade in the next set of trades down. And there will be several items that I can buy for one emerald and the price is never going to change. The same goes for the stonemasons trades. I'm not really looking to get emeralds from these villagers. Instead, I'm looking to buy resources that are easier to get this way and able to get renewably that way, like the quartz and the dripstone. But when it comes to the farmers and the librarians, obviously we're going to benefit from having a discount on their trades because the stuff we're buying from them is typically going to cost more emeralds. And we're also going to be able to trade resources to them in smaller quantities to get emeralds from them individually, like we do with this farmer, who we did cure from a zombie originally around here. And this farmer allows us to trade one pump pumpkin and one melon per emerald instead of six and four. But those villagers up there aren't going to have that discount right away and the reason for that is that I'm playing on normal difficulty and have been from the beginning of this series. Eventually, I think relatively soon, I'm going to be upgrading the difficulty to hard, but until I do that, there is a 50-50 chance of a zombie straight up killing one of my villagers up there instead of converting them into a zombie villager which I could then cure. On hard difficulty, that shifts so that a zombified villager will always come out of a villager being killed by a zombie. Anytime a zombie bites a villager and deals enough damage, it will always turn into a zombie villager on hard difficulty, which allows you to cure them 100% of the time. But it's worth pointing out that for those of us who are playing on easy or normal difficulties, 
the ratio changes there, and on easy difficulty, your villagers will always die from a zombie attack instead of converting. So if you were populating a villager trading hall on easy difficulty, the best approach would be to basically trap and cure a bunch of zombified villagers instead of breeding villagers like this if you wanted to take full advantage of the discounts. Now as we've noted in previous episodes, it's not possible to zombify and cure villagers multiple times to get a stacking discount anymore. The only way to get additional discounts would be to allow the villagers line of sight to each other so that they could gossip, and that potentially risks them pairing with workstations that they think they can pathfind to, so I'm avoiding that for now. And the other way is to get Hero of the Village from completing a Pillager raid, which is something that we might do a bit more of in future, but right now I don't have easy enough access to anywhere other than right here, where I don't really want pillagers and ravagers coming in and invading my territory. So for the moment, I'm not going to zombify and cure each of these villagers, but if you decide to set up a system that allows you to do that, you trap a zombie and introduce the villagers to it, you might actually want to do that as a middle step on the way to populating a trading hall like this. We're going to leave that step off for now, but in future, I might actually in a controlled set of circumstances, introduce a zombie to some of the villagers in here that I want to cure. That might end up with us spawning a bunch of iron golems so that they defend themselves, but that's uh, a bridge we'll cross when we come to it. For now, I just wanted to explain why I'm not putting the zombification step in whilst I populate my trading hall. But as for the other villager professions, I think we are going to dedicate one corner of this large square area here to each of the blacksmith professions. We want to have armorers, weaponsmiths, and toolsmiths. And then as far as the other villager professions go, I'm not certain which ones I want to keep around here and which ones I think will be better suited elsewhere. I might even save one corner for one of each of the remaining professions. So a cartographer, a butcher, a fisherman, a leather worker, those kind of professions I don't expect I will need that often. I won't need the shepherds particularly often either. And if you want to be super comprehensive with the trades and be able to trade every resource that is possible to have from some of those villages, you might need a great deal of them because some of them will trade blocks in 16 colors, so you might need to get a bunch of different shepherds before you had all 16 colors of wool covered, especially since some of them might double up. Even though I have found the Fletcher's stick trade really useful in the past and might consider bringing that in in larger quantities here, I don't know if I'm going to rely on that for the foreseeable future as a way of gathering emeralds because we have the melon and pumpkin farm now and eight farmers should be able to get us a decent return on the melons and pumpkins. So there are still some decisions to be made, but I think the majority of the professions we want to trade with long term are already getting settled in and it's just a matter of moving in and recruiting some librarians. But that is going to be a time consuming process, not just getting the librarians, but getting the trades that we want out of the librarians. So I think that's something I will continue to do between episodes. And for now, that's where we'll wrap up this episode of the the Minecraft survival guide. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed this look at installing a villager trading hall in this world, and we are going to rescue that villager from the igloo so that we have our Mending and Silk Touch villager up here as well. In fact, I'm pretty sure we're going to name him Mendelssohn after the villager that we had in season one of the survival guide as kind of a tribute to the, the iconic characters of that series. But folks, thank you so much for watching this episode. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.